Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries. And let's just go before the Lord in prayer. I got a word for you this morning. Father, we just love you. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day that you have made. Lord, there's a revelation and a truth in this day that we need to seek it and we need to find it and we need to pray to understand it. So, Father, we're going to just teach your word. And I just pray everybody listening will understand and comprehend it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message is, They That Wait. You know, I've preached probably everything that I could think to preach in, 20, in 33 years of preaching. But you know, they, I get it, still get a new thought about these different topics. They That Wait. We know out of Isaiah, we're going to see it in a minute. It said, They That Wait Upon the Lord Shall Renew Their Strength. But... The idea is that God's people have lost, and I, I think I've said this a bunch of times too, but God's people have lost that ability and that talent to wait upon the Lord, to just sit and wait and worship until we re begin to get a revelation and a word from God. You know, God is speaking to His people. He's showing this world His invisible truth. By all the things that were created, it says in Romans 1.20, you know, that the invisible things of God are clearly seen in the things that were made. That there's no excuse. So in other words, God expects us as spiritual beings to connect with the spiritual that's around us. I don't, I don't want to try to make everything spiritual, but there's a spiritual realm. When a person dies, their spirit leaves their body and goes into that spiritual realm. That spiritual realm is, is more real than this realm. God created this planet and everything on it, including us, to be a revelation about what is in that invisible realm. Can you comprehend that today? You know, you, you live in your life and you're doing things, good and bad. And, you know, you're coming to these conclusions in your life. And then there's, because we're not aware of the spiritual realm, there's all these questions that come in our mind. You know, like, where, where should we go? What should we do? What's going to happen in this world with this pandemic? Are we heading into the tribulation time? You know, is the, is the vaccine bad for us to be able to track us? Or is it the mark of the beast? All of these questions that I see flooding into the church. And then on top of it, you got people leaving the church because the pandemic, but they're leaving the church because, and they shouldn't, because if they had faith in Christ, then maybe they wouldn't leave the church. But people are leaving the church. People are getting and getting themselves wrapped up in New Age and progressive Christianity, and you know, people, you know, just get saved and don't have to change and so forth. There's so much stuff out there that we need to hear from God about, and this is going to involve. They that wait. So let's look at some things this morning. When should we wait? I got four questions and we're going to look at them real quick. When should we wait? When we look at our problems and they overwhelm us. You know, the sun is, is like, I don't know, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times bigger than our planet. Yet you could stand outside and with your thumb putting it close to your eye, you can block out the sun. Your, your thumb can cover the whole sun. When our moon comes across between the sun and the earth, it can block out the sun for a period of time. Yet, the sun is, I don't know, a thousand times bigger than the moon. You know, and, and our problems can be that way. When our problems start to get in our face, and that's all you see is the problem, and you can't see past that problem to get a, a, an answer inside your soul, you know. Uh, for instance, a person can't, can't balance the checkbook and the bills, and next thing you know, their house goes into foreclosure, and then they're being forced into going to bankrupt. That could be an overwhelming thing to a person. You know, I'm going to lose my house. But if you could just back that problem out, yeah, you still might have to go bankrupt, but as you focus in on God, and you wait on the Lord, all of a sudden you'll start knowing on the inside, God's got another place for me. God's got something else. You know, sometimes God wants to move you to another state or some place where there's more work or something and start your whole life over. But God is the one who's 
orchestrating it. You know, in um, 1 Corinthians 6, the Bible says he paid a great price and we don't own our lives anymore. So as a believer, God can move us anywhere he wants. He can do anything he wants with us because we laid down our lives when we received the life of Christ. And so now, just like my hands and my feet, when my brain decides I want to walk over there, you know, my feet can't say, I don't feel like going over there. They, because they're just part of my body and I can just walk over there. But if I got paralyzed, they could rebel. They won't pick up the signal. And you know, that's what happens sometimes when, uh, when our problems become so big, is that we, get, we can become paralyzed to what the Lord is doing in our lives. And that's the whole part of this whole message, is that stuff like this. When should we wait? When, our, when we look at our problems, at our problems, and they overwhelm us, they become too big. Second thing is, when should we wait? When we lose all hope. <laughs> Actually, you should wait on the Lord way before you lose all hope. But it always seems like because of our sinful nature that's still part of our being, our carnal nature, that we wait to the very end. We lose all hope. We uh, begin to just give up. And many, many people leave the church and leave, and leave Christ. And they might say, oh, yeah, I still believe in Jesus. But... You know, I mean, he, he failed me type of thing. And they might not want to say that, but that's how they're feeling because they walk away from Christ. Where they used to be on fire for Jesus and the, the joy of their salvation was, was predominant in their lives and their friends and family saw it, some received it, some shoved them out because of that, that excitement, that joy of your salvation. And now that has come down a notch or two, maybe more than that. Maybe you completely left the Lord back in the world trying to find pleasure and sin for a season you know and and the problems got so big that you lost hope maybe losing that house like that example I said a minute ago was overwhelming that's a bad example to my Christian walk I cannot lose I cannot lose my house and the Lord saying let it go it's just a house but what is everybody else gonna think well don't worry about what everybody else thinks Right now, you need to have peace of mind and peace of heart. Right now, you need to get this burden off of your back. Right now, you need to walk away from that thing and let the Lord lead you to someplace else and someplace better. To many, Katrina was a major disaster. You know, I mean, it really was a disaster. But, but with many, they got insurance money and the road home money and, and, those, and that grant money. And, and they're actually living better than what they were living before Katrina. And, uh, you know, so God's got a plan, especially for his people. But when should we wait? When we lose all hope. That's, you know, just drop everything and just sit down and cry out to the Lord. I've been there. The third thing is, when should we wait? When we don't see the way out. You know, you're praying, you're seeking God, and you say, Lord, I'm financially I can't afford this anymore I can't pay my bills I don't see any way out I, um, you know I don't see where I'm gonna be able to go I'm, uh, you know right now in the midst of the pandemic there's businesses shutting down they, they letting people go and these people that was their livelihood they don't know how to do anything else some of them and so right now they're sitting at home and they don't see a way out and they saying oh my god what am I gonna do how am I gonna feed my family how am I going to take care of the kids? And on and on it goes. You know, they, they were living at such a, a standard in their life. Sometimes the husband and wife are both working as it is. And then they lose one of the incomes. And they just cannot even afford to pay the house note anymore. And it gets bad. You know, these are problems. And everybody listening to me, there's problems. I mean, there's some people that got the, the COVID virus. And they were told to quarantine from their family. How are they going to do that? And so now they're feeling guilty because maybe their loved ones now are catching the virus because of them, because they can't just go in the room and shut the door and lock themselves in. And so they're overwhelmed, you know, and the, and the guilt that comes on them that, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm spreading the coronavirus, you know. Listen, this, this virus is a little tiny thing compared to the size of God. We need to trust in the Lord with all our heart. We need to rest and wait in the Lord. And the fourth thing, when should we wait? 
when all we do is complain. Listen to yourself. If your situation is causing you to just constantly complain, constantly complain, constantly complain, you know, that's a sure sign that it's time to wait and be still before God and start to fill yourself up with truth and revelation and stand still and see the salvation. There's so many stories in the Bible that I could use. Like I just said, you know, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Israel was delivered after those ten plagues and went over to the Red Sea and they had no way to escape. And then God stirred up the Egyptians because he had a plan and that was to destroy them. And they came with their chariots. God put a fire between them and Israel and then he parted the Red Sea. They were all freaking out. They were all paranoid and and thought they were going to die and everything else. And then Moses put forth his staff. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then the Red Sea parted and they went all the way across on the other side. And when the Egyptians went through, everybody knows the story that God released the waters on each side and crushed them and killed them all. And they were seen no more. And even Pharaoh himself was drowned in the Red Sea. You know, and, and all the people came through and they, and they saw this tremendous miracle by God. And you know, God's got a miracle for you today. God's, you're, you might be at a Red Sea experience. The bankers are calling you up. You're going to lose your house. Um, you know, you got, you know, this happening and that happening. And the child, you know, your child's in the hospital and, and uh, they say he's dying of cancer or he's dying of this. And, and uh, the child might go home and be with the Lord. I can't guarantee you that the miracle is going to be your child's going to come up and get up out of that bed. But the miracle will be the peace of God in the midst of the storm. Knowing that God is for you and he will never leave you and never forsake you. You know, that, that could be the miracle that you need. Just the peace of God throughout that storm. And, uh, you know, God's got a miracle experience for you. How big is your faith? How, you know... Uh, how how strong is your is your belief system? That's going to really depend on waiting on the Lord. When should we wait? Now let's go look at the scriptures. Isaiah 40, 26 through 31. We're going to take it piece by piece. We're going to take a look at it. And it starts off on 26. Look at the sky and see. That's what Isaiah said. Who created these things? Who brings out the stars one by one? He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Now, let's, let's get the mindset about this scripture. What is, what is the prophet writing? He's being moved upon by the Spirit. He's saying, look at the sky. You look up at night and see the stars. You go someplace where there's very little street lights or whatever and you'll see even more stars. There's just so much out there. You know, the Bible says, I think it's in Isaiah, God measured the, the whole universe with the span of his hand. He is a magnificent, big, holy, righteous, merciful God. And he, he loves doing miracles. He loves creating things and demonstrating who he is. Some, some people might say, well, that's pride. No, he's God. And he can do it. Pride is when you do something that anybody else can basically do, but you do it, and now you're prideful about it. You know? God created everything. And so we gotta get this first we gotta get this mindset in us before we go on about how big God is. You know, I said this before and, and I was looking up the size of the of the stars and so forth and there's a star up there in the sky, and it could be trillions of them, if not more than that. And it's so big that they say that an airplane traveling at 400 miles an hour, going around at one star, one, one time, it would take it like 1,100 years to do it. That's an incredibly big star. We can't even comprehend that. That's so big. Yet, the universe is filled up with those different size stars. We, there's no way they can know how many big stars. There might be stars out there bigger than that. But God measured the whole universe with the span of his hand. That's incredible. He's bigger than the universe. 
He's bigger than your problem. He's bigger than anything that can go down in this life that is against you. The Bible says if God is for you, and he is, who can be against you? Or we can even add to that, we can say, and what? What could be against you? Somebody, they pronounce and they say, you know, you have cancer, you got three months to live. That would be pretty terrible, especially if you've got young children and so forth. And there's no guarantee or promise that, that you're going to survive that. I do know people that have survived cancer, and they're still alive, and they're years and years. Doctor said, you know, you got about two years to live, and they, they've been living 15 years. Their cancer is in, in remission, and so forth. But I do also, I know others that have died of cancer, and they left behind children and so forth. It's a painful thing. You know, Jesus said in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Well, that is tribulation. That is things that, uh, yeah, we, we suffer through. And some people grieve themselves to death. They, they can't move on. They can't pick up their life and continue. And I understand all of it. It's all there. It's all part of the curse and, and this, that happened when Adam and Eve sinned. It's all part of that. There's, there's terrible things that came in when Adam partook of that fruit. And I don't even know if all of the bad things have been manifested yet. They got, there's a lot of bad things going to be happening in the future. You know, there's just so many things to sidetrack us, to beat us down, to, to create difficulties in our life. You know, when God, I don't want to preach on the curse right now that happened, but when the curse came in uh, because of sin, it was designed by God. Say, God put this curse? What kind of God puts a curse? The idea about the curse is really simple. God pulled back. God was taking care of them and providing and, and doing miracles. And, and it's on and on. Who knows what he was doing, but he was doing tremendous, great, wonderful things for Adam and Eve. You know, and so when sin came, God didn't just pull away completely because man would have ceased to exist. But he backed up on providing and all of that and said, you go out and grow your own crops. You deal with the, the bugs and everything else. You deal with everything. You want to be God? Because that's what the serpent told them. You shall be like God. And they like that idea. So really the curse is simply God pulling back. Without God being there to take care of us, to love us, to do all the wonderful things that, that God was doing with his universe, you will die. Well, we're all going to die physically, but you're going to die. You, you can't live without God. We were not designed to live without God. You're trying to work out all your problems without God. You, you might get limited success. Something good might break over, and next thing you know, you win the lottery. What chance is that? I don't know. But the idea is that some miracle or something might happen, and then you still stay away from God. But something else is going to happen that's out of control. People turn to, to drinking heavy and using drugs because they cannot deal with their troubles and their problems. Especially depression. How do you get rid of depression? Everybody gets depressed at times, but some have a chronic depression. These are all problems in this life. All of this came in with the curse. But God's got an answer for every problem, every situation. He said he'd never leave us. He'd never forsake us. The point of my message here is to show you how big God is and what can happen if you wait upon the Lord. So right here we see that everything was created by him. That's what the scriptures tell us. By him and for his pleasure. And right here he, knew, he, knows, he knows the stars and he calls them by name. He named all those billions and trillions and zillions of stars that are out there. He knows every one of them that's out there. How much more does he know you? He knows everything about you. He designed you a certain way. And if you would just wait on the Lord, which I can't really explain, it's just really your mind and your heart just being quiet and still and waiting on the Lord and paying attention to the, to the thoughts that come into your head as God speaks to you, you won't realize it, but you'll start getting thoughts in your head about what to do and how to seek the Lord and how to pray. 
You, I mean, so many things will start coming from the Lord. But you need to shut down everything else. You need to stop complaining, stop worrying. That's a hard thing to do. But you have to do it. Because if you're sitting there waiting on the Lord, but you're still dwelling on the problem, then you're not waiting on the Lord. You're actively involved in trying to figure out your problem. You know, and um, we need Jesus. Verse 27 says, Jacob. Now Jacob, he's talking to Israel here, and we need to understand that, that this is a big picture about what he's doing with everybody. He says, Jacob, why do you complain? He can say that to me. Jimmy, why do you, why do you complain? You know I'm a big God. You know I'm a holy God. You know that I love you. You know that I, I gave my son on a cross for you. I, I don't want you to die in despair. I've left you here to be a witness to, to show other people my love and my mercy. I've overlooked your sins. I have forget not just overlooked them, but he said, I have washed them away. And when I and when I sin again, he and I repent, he washes them away. You know, and he's faithful and just to complete the work he's begun in me. You know, and he's saying, Jimmy, wake up. Stop complaining. Be still. Listen. I got a plan. He says, Israel, why do you say my way is hidden from the Lord and my rights are ignored by my God? Listen to what Israel was saying about God. He's saying, God selected us as his chosen people. But yet, he's allowing these troubles and these problems to come in. These nations, these, these uh, kingdoms, we, we start growing crops and right when it's time to harvest, here comes the Chaldeans, here comes the Assyrians, here comes those from Moab. Here come, and they come in and they plunder and take their crops. Now what we're going to do, we're going to starve to death. And really the problem the problem that they were having and w which was causing these these enemies to come in was because they were sinning they had turned away from God they were worshiping idols they brought in false gods and God was saying you don't want to serve me any longer well now you deal with the the Syrians and you deal with the Moabites. you deal with them I'm not going to deal with them for you because I'm not your God anymore the same the same thing that happened with Adam you know Adam had everything provided for him and then he sinned and God said you can't live in my garden any longer because I'm not your God anymore you have made yourself your own God now you go out and you go be God well they, <laughs> look what happened everything that God was holding back which was part of the curse God wasn't holding it back anymore cancer disease death wars pestilence rape, murder, I can go on and on, I could preach for an hour and hour just naming sins. But all of that came in because of Adam wanting to be God. Israel was worshiping idols. God was just saying, hey, let your carved idol get you out of this dilemma. So it wasn't, it wasn't really when you read, it says God sent in, but what he's simply saying is, as I'm pulling back my hand, imagine a dam, like the Hoover Dam or something like that. And the dam cracks, and you're standing there. Are you, do you think you'll be waiting for the water to come through? It's going to come through instantly. You know, you got to understand that. That the moment God lifts his hands, everything's coming. Instantly. He's holding it back. He's the light. Think about that. You're in your house, in the room, no windows, and you got the light on so you can see. How long does it take? when you turn the light off for that darkness to flood in that room it, it's instantaneous you see it's it's already there but the light is holding it back think about that God is holding back the storms well you say hey why did I find myself in this position I can't say that it was because of sin only I can't say that it was because of your lack of faith only but it was some reason inside of our carnal body and mind that has produced the darkness in our life. When Israel turned and worshipped idols, God pulled back. You see, God saying, let your idol deliver you. And then they started crying out to God. Go read the book of Judges and you'll understand where I'm coming from. And then they start crying out for God, help us, help us. And so God began to be, you know, sad over them and merciful and he 
rose up. You always would raise up a judge. And they would just come back to God and he would deliver them and, and they might live with God for 40 years and then they turn their backs on God again and over and over it went. How many times have you turned your back on God? How many times have I turned my back on God? That's what waiting is all about. Waiting on the Lord. Repenting while you're in that waiting mode. Forgive me Lord for what I've done. You know, not covering up our sins, not sitting there justifying what we've done. Be like that publican instead of that Pharisee who put his face before the Lord and he just said, have mercy on me, a sinner. But the, but the Pharisee said, I don't, I'm, thank God, I thank you God, I'm not like that publican. I do this and I do that and so I deserve your blessings, period. But it was the publican who left justified. You know, so right here, Israel, why are you complaining? You've seen my salvation. You've seen the miracles. You've seen my love. Then it goes on to say, don't you know, haven't you heard the eternal God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, doesn't grow tired or become weary. His understanding is beyond reach. Now, you cannot understand God. It's, it's too gigantic. It's, it's beyond reach. You don't have the ability to comprehend what is happening. That's why we have to be still and know he's God. We got to wait upon the Lord because we need that. Just think about a child not old enough to do some things and the parent will say you're not old enough. It's not time. You can't do this yet. You're too little. Well they might go pout. They might run off to the room and complain. But understanding why is, is not within their reach because they're children. We can't comprehend God and what's going on around us. There's too much darkness around us. There's too much, too many bad things. You know, there'll be no hospitals in heaven because nobody's going to get sick. That's awesome. We won't need, we won't need anything, you know. People are risking their life to climb Mount Everest. You'll be able to fly or jump or run up the side of a mountain. There'll be no big deal because you'll have renewed strength. You're going to have God strengthen you. But right now, we need him. We need him right now. You need him right now. You're losing faith. You're losing hope. You know, your continence is falling. You don't have a joy of the Lord anymore. You're leaning on things you shouldn't be leaning on. You're making up excuses. Listen, people, just stop all of that and come to the Lord. You know, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow tired. You can't wear God out in your troubles. Bring it all. Come, all are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, Jesus said, you know. Just lay all your burdens at his feet. He can handle everybody's burdens at the same time, every day, and not grow weary. He's God. And that was the whole thing that was going on with Adam. God maintained a perfect garden, a perfect place on this planet that could be maintained forever and ever and ever. And he failed, cut himself off from God, and was then kicked out of this perfect world into a dark world that we're all still living in today. Don't trust this world. Trust in the Lord. 29 says, He gives strength to those who grow tired and increases the strength of those who are weak. You know, here's the thought. There's no way you can understand God. There's no way that you can just look around without having spiritual eyes and even see God. There's no way that you can come up with the answer to your dilemma. You can make, people can adapt. They lose their house, they go out in the streets and they beg. Well, next thing you know, winter comes and they're looking for warmer places to live. L.A. right now in, in uh, California, there's so many homeless, it's unbelievable because it stays pretty warm, you know, and they, can, and they have a tent city over there and so forth. You know, they, make a, they adapt to things. We, we are able to adapt to, to even the bad things in life. We got pain pills now if you got a bad back and you're praying about your healing. Well, there are steroid shots and stuff like that. But they didn't have that a hundred years ago. They didn't have that way back when. You suffered. 
You know, we got things right now that we can do. You get a headache, take some Advil, Tylenol, whatever, and get rid of your headache. You don't have to really pray through some of this stuff. You can just go to your medicine cabinet. You know, and, and so forth and so on. That we adapt to things. We're learning how to fix things and come up with vaccines and, and, and shots of antibiotics and so forth to get us through some of the problems of life. But we still, it's still a problem. There's still one, there's still many problems. So you get, you take a, a shot and get rid of pain in your body and then next thing you know you wake up and some other pain is there. And on and on it goes. We need God. And He gives, you know, He, he increased strength in us and, and helps us so that we can, you see, so that we can get out of this carnal thinking. He's so merciful that He gives us a thought that comes out of nowhere. And it just simply says, you need me. Might be a dream in the middle of the night. And you wake up the next morning and you don't even realize that it was God giving you that strength. You see? That he's giving you what you need so you can seek him. You don't even realize how that's the mercy of God. All of a sudden, you wake up and things are different. You start realizing your purpose in life. You start understanding that, hey, I don't have to live this way. There are things I can do. Well, where do you think that came from? You wasn't thinking about it the night before. It came in a dream. It came in a vision. It came in God speaking into you. You know, understand that God is still merciful. He's speaking into the unsaved out there that they need Him. That's why they come to the Lord eventually, maybe. Or they, they actually really resist God. Because they actually hear that going on inside of them. He gives strength to those who are weak. Verse 30. Even young people grow tired and become weary. And young men will stumble and fall. The point of this one is, is that I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. Troubles are coming to you. Period. You live in this world, you're going to have troubles. You know, how can a rich person sit in a mansion someplace and have money to do anything they want, buy anything they want, and not feel the pain of this world? They have to really, really cut themselves off. That's why many rich people are alcoholics. They got the money. They can drown the world out. They can take and drink and drug and whatever and drown the world. I'm not saying all of them. I'm not trying to put every rich person in that same boat. But they have money. They can... They can Stop thinking about bad things and go on a vacation anytime they want. Go to the mountains, go see something, go on a cruise. They're always doing something. So the moment they sit down, they start looking at this world and it gets to them too. So they have to go buy something new and get wrapped up in that for a little while. Even, even poor people do it. They get a little bit money and they, they want to go on a vacation. You know, you see, it's our nature to know and to see new things. God made us this way. But it has to do with new things in God and who He is. He's a magnificent God that has great things to show us. There's so many things to experience in God. But we always look into this world to give us the answer. The world does not have your answer. They might have a temporary fix but they don't have the answer. See, so this scripture is telling us that even the strong go through struggles. Now here comes verse 31. Yet the strength of those who wait with hope in the Lord will be renewed. Now I use this particular set of scriptures out of God's word because I like the way it was worded, get a little bit better understanding. Yet, because in the, in the King James it says, and, and those that, and they that wait upon the Lord shall be, shall renew their strength, they shall rise up with wings. Well, this one is like adding a little bit. It's not like adding, but it's English words to explain the, the Hebrew. Yet the strength of those who wait with hope, with hope. If I'm going to wait, I'm going to believe that there's an answer coming. You see what I'm saying? That's why I like this, because if I'm going to sit down and wait on the Lord, then I'm having that hope that I'm going to get an answer. If I don't have that hope, I'm not going to wait. That's the point. With hope in the Lord will be renewed. God's going to see your hope and see what you're doing. And that faith of seeking Him 
it's going to bring a reward. My, one of my favorite scriptures, Hebrews um, 11, 6, and it, where it says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. You first have to believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder to those that diligently seek him. So that's what's happening here. He will renew. They will be renewed. We need to be renewed in our Christian walk. If you're a Christian and you're going through some depression, you need to come back to the joy of your salvation. Come back to the truth of the love of God who loves you so much that He gave His Son for you. Man, I had a tremendous salvation. Can't say it went that way with everybody else because I don't know. But I had a tremendous salvation. God came into my life, in my room, in my heart, and I was totally changed. Everybody that knew me saw it. And uh, I got I to gotta be reminded of that at times. I got to go back to that at times. Sometimes I start questioning God myself. Where are you? Are you I'm, I'm beginning to believe you're not real. And he brings me back to that salvation. Remember that day? Wow. It was overwhelming powerful. It was revelation truth. I it was so real, and it is real, and it will continue to be real. And then the longer you're on the Lord, the more things that God brings you through, you have that now as a testimony. And he says, they will soar with wings like eagles. What he's saying here, you can't have, you can't, you can't fly, but this is an expression that God can bring you up to let you see the big picture, to see how big God is. And how small the giants are and the problems are. But it takes God's spirit to raise you up to see that. They will run and won't become weary. They will walk and won't grow tired. Go watch some videos on Mount Everest and those people climbing. When they get up in that death zone, it takes them forever just to go 10 feet. They only, their legs are so hurting and weighing so much because of the lack of oxygen. And this one step and then they got to take a break a second to next step it's so slow and they, yet they just want to go up there on the top and say hey I climbed the mountain but right here it's saying that in everything in life it's a Mount Everest everything you go through is a Mount Everest it's, it will wear you down the, the oxygen you need is from heaven you will begin to lack oxygen because there's just not enough of it on this planet to if you understand what I'm talking about I'm talking about spiritual oxygen revelation truth that you breathe in and you can just feel the salvation of the Lord. They will walk and won't grow tired. Say, so walking's easy, huh? Not to some people it isn't. You know, your troubles, especially your burdens and problems, become weights that you're carrying. I heard a story one time, I don't know how real it is or anything, but, uh, but I remember reading this, that um, they crashed and they had some gold balls, these two guys, and began to head out of the desert because they had crashed in the desert. Well, as they walk and they're carrying these gold, these gold bars, and finally they knew if we continue to carry this extra weight, we're not going to make it out of here, and then what good is the gold? So they threw the gold away. It had no value. Life was the value. And then they made it out. I don't know if they ever went back to try to find the gold, but they, they, wasn't, they were going to die if they didn't let go of that weight, which was very, very valuable. But they found out that life was more valuable. Eternal life is more valuable than anything that can be promised you on this earth. Man shall not live by bread alone, Jesus said. They, the devil offered them the kingdoms of the world. He said, you shall worship the Lord thy God, him alone shall you serve. In other words, none of these kingdoms have any value. What has value is knowing God. Don't you understand that? And they will walk and won't grow tired. Listen, people of God. I wrote this. This is my statement. Listen, people of God. You will never find the way out unless you know the way. It's pretty interesting because I capitalized that. Let me show you why. In John 14, 1 through 6, and then I'm going to close. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. Once you become born again, God begins to prepare a place for you in heaven. Understand that. 
when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. Now watch what he says. And you know the way to where I am going. Now watch what the disciples say. No. We don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? He was looking at him. And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We're heading to see the Father. The journey is all about seeing the one who has created all things through Jesus Christ. And Thomas couldn't understand, just like many of us. If I told you, just wait upon the Lord. Just sit, listen, stop complaining, stop dwelling on your problem. You might respond to me, I can't help it. I can't help it, it's, it's in my face. I, I can't. I, I mean, if, if I don't get a job soon and get some money, I'm going to lose my house and this and that. And I am like, I understand that. But sit and be still and find out what God will tell you what to do. You got to clear your mind. I can't clear my mind. You need to clear your mind. You need to stop thinking about the problem. You need to say, Lord, help me. Show me. Please help me to stop thinking about this problem long enough so I can hear your voice and see your answer. This is what we need to do. Jesus is the way. Listen, people of God, you will never find a way out. You're not going to find the answer. You might find a temporary fix, but there's another trouble coming. You're not going to live on this earth and not have trouble. Especially the longer you live, the older you're getting, the more pains, the more troubles, the more your mind's gone away, the more your hearing's gone, the more your sight's gone, on and on. Not too many people live to be very old and have their perfect health, let me tell you. You know, there's something going on in their bodies. They have pain, they have suffering. There's no, nobody aging on this earth that's exempt, you know. But there is a way out of your problem if you know Jesus the way. So let's just pray right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your truth. We thank you right now because you created us and you formed us to, to just have you, your presence and your glory and who you are inside of us. To have a hope and a calling. And then when it's all done, I'll witness to this world and we'll go home and live with you. In the meantime, help us to be a witness to the dying world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.